This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for Resolve Dash Masterclass. Happy Friday. Welcome. Happy Friday, boys. Guys, we've got Tom Morgan on the horn here today. Tom, welcome. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Tom, what is it that you do and uh, who do you do it with? Uh, well, wait, hold on, Tom, before you jump in there like that. Adam, really, come we've, on. We've always got to lead with Friday. The, Happy Friday. But compliance. We, we have to lead with that? compliance. I so, just want to uh, make sure Mike. that we, we set the table to have a very open and honest. There we go. I love it. I love it. Poor, poor Tom is is nursing. What is it? A four week old? Full week. Yeah. I guess you're not nursing it, but you're we're living through it. <laughs> I was gonna I wanted to explore that. Yeah. <laughs> Modern anyway. technology. Okay. Yeah. So so you know, don't take investment advice from four dudes on YouTube where one is sleep deprived from raising a four week old child. Definitely don't do that. We're gonna have a good conversation. And Tom's got some amazing ideas and viewpoints on the world. So this is gonna be fun. Uh Tom, yeah, tell us who you are, what you do, what you do there. And where you are. Uh, yeah, so I'm currently the Director of Communications and Content uh, for the KCP Group. Uh, we're a, a large wealth manager based out of Indianapolis. Uh, we manage money for uh, you know families, endowments, ultra high net uh, worth individuals. Um, and I don't really know what I do, which is why my job is so amazing. Um, I, I describe myself as a curiosity sherpa. My official title is uh, director of communications and content, which I think makes me sound a bit like I'm in PR, um, which I'm not. Um, and I guess, I guess the sort of one to two sentence description and explanation is that there's just way, way, way too much information out there, and people I don't think have necessarily realised quite yet that. If you want to get into people's workflow, you have to have a reason to get in there, or you have to be saying something that's of value. And I spent like you know 15 years on on the sell side before that, so sort of the hard training, easy combat of of continuously trying to get into people's workflow who didn't want to hear from you. And I realized that you know if you're not if you're not saving people time or making the money, there's really nothing that you have to add. And so I've been trying to bring that approach to you know our client base to it very very curious and i think quite sophisticated and i try and just put stuff in front of them that i think is of perennial importance rather than just necessarily what's going on right at this exact moment how do you, how do you define could... save time or make money uh oh. <laughs> trial and error mike <laughs> <laughs> good for you give us a bit on your background tom if you wouldn't mind like how, the journey that took you to where you are now and how you think that helps inform your, your, your thoughts and, and, and how you view the world of finance and the broader picture? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm actually in an incredibly good position uh, to talk about what I talk about because I've made so many catastrophic errors in my career. Um, and, I, and I'm probably still going to make them. Um, but I spent, as I said, um, you know, just under 15 years on the sell side selling research and data. Um, and basically it started off very early as here's a collection of insights from our research team and after writing a summer email for the buy side for a decade it came became more of here's how all these insights get tied together and here's why you should care about those things and then it became a reciprocal relationship with the people that i spoke to when i i learned how to use their time in a more judicious way and so they started giving me good stuff and i i just started becoming like a nexus of information which is what I, I still am on the buy side, just because I've got so many wonderful people that I interact with. And 
get so much value from. And then everything fell apart. Um, I, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. I left. I had like a full-blown nervous breakdown. I spent three years wandering the professional desert, no idea what to do. And through a series of events, um, I ended up getting spotted uh, by Tom Pence, uh, the, the P of KCP. And, you know, the guys there realized that, that maybe I could do something in terms of synthesis. And so rather than the individual pieces of information that I started off with, I now synthesize all the stuff that I've learned over the last, you know, 10, 15 years into hopefully something that's relatively coherent, but is often just a collection of other people's insights and how they fit together in a way that I think is interesting. Actually, so the threads are starting to come together for me because just sort of going back to your sell side work, um, I, I worked in a role like that for a few years and the it, it's, a, it's astonishing the amount of um, bottom up research that, that comes across the desk, right? And there is such an important role in almost finding the first few principal components of that information array, right? You've got, you've got all this information hitting, but there's a synthesis of theme that is missing if you just sort of list all the research pieces today, where there's a real opportunity to kind of say, well, you, here you have a, a bunch of analysts who are experts approaching the problem from slightly different angles. I can take the decomposition of those and sort of it, and, and tease out the top two or three themes, but it's it's not sort of a, a top down. You're not forming a narrative by sort of looking at at the big the big muscle movements, but rather you're you're sort of you're watching the picture emerge from the bottom up, right? And and I find that 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 carries through having sort of read through a lot of your um, your work. That's a core theme of your work. Right, it's it's this synthesis, this bottom up, this emergent type of of phenomenon that seems to inform your not just the way you your brain works, but um, your approach to the world and the things that you like to explore. Would that be an accurate characterization? Totally, totally. And 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 I don't mean this this insight to be self serving, but I think one thing that's really interesting. So so Jim O'Shaughnessy and, and Brian Romilly. Uh, recommended a book to me that's, I think, entered my top three quite quickly, that's called The User Illusion. And it's a very, very simple concept in it, which is um, the value of information is derived from the, uh, the, the volume of informa information discarded to create it. So basically, if I've read 100 pieces of research that morning, which often is what we would produce, and here is the one to two insights that come out of it, that's what's valuable assuming that you have the pattern recognition and the quote unquote wisdom to be able to do that filtering process. And that sort of is the meta skill of synthesis where you can find things that are really valuable. And the opposite is sort of what I used to call complexity catnip on the buy side, which is where people would, would build up all these abstractions in order to create these theses that sounded incredibly smart to their PMs, but actually had no bearing on reality. And it's something I'm writing about for this weekend and in the hardest piece I've ever had to write in my life. It's taken me 100 hours and my brain is scrambled. But the, one of the funny bits of it is this, um, this, this study that Michael Mobison always references of horse handicappers where they gave them five pieces of information to choose from. You yeah. guys are all nodding. You've heard it, right? Yeah, no, but, yeah, but go for it. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Everyone else has it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they gave them five pieces of information. Then they gave them like 10, 20, and 40 pieces of information. They got more confident, but they didn't get more accurate. And it's this phenomenon of confirmation bias where you can go two ways with information. You can either start with a shed load and filter down to what's true, or you can start with one piece that you've already agreed on and then and then just find everything on the internet that confirms to that viewpoint. And those two different directions are sort of the difference between useless information and invaluable wisdom. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Richard, I think, I think that's a good segue to a theme you wanted to explore in more depth, right? Yeah, I mean, Doing some of the writing here at Resolve, I'm always curious to learn a little bit more about people's processes for the writing. And what's interesting about your writing is that you start at a pretty high level, 30,000 foot view kind of thing, and then you narrow down into something that you wanna discuss that you think has an overlap or has a relevance that you can extrapolate to broader themes. Then you zoom right back out. So you, you, you do this, uh, 
up and down sort of movement. And I'm, I'm, I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about the process that you that you undergo and, and whether it changes from uh, from piece to piece. Yeah, I mean, well, let's step back for a sec. So I've been doing this now for 10 months, um, although I've been writing for you know, 10 years, just not very well. Um, I've spoken to all of my heroes, you know, the, the Morgan Housels of this world, you know, all of the best newsletter writers on, on Fintwit. And I was like, all right, what's, what's the universal feature of good content? Uh, and I wrote a piece on it because I was so intrigued by it. And and this is going to sound like a cliche, but a lot of the stuff I say and write sounds like cliches because I think there's something universal in there. And it's basically that if you're following something that you're intrinsically interested in and you're doing it in a relatively vulnerable and authentic way, not pretending that you know everything about it, because we all know in finance, that's the fastest way to get blown up, right? If you're like, I don't really know what this means, but I'm really curious about it, and I'm just going to throw it out there, that has a startlingly high success rate because you will almost always find your tribe. Whenever people optimize for doing something that they think other people are going to like or whatever's trendy at that moment, if it's not in their individual skill set, it's going to be very generic very, very, very quickly. And so I've just seen these guys just really focus in on what they want to be and what they want to do. And if they sell out, it becomes quite obvious quite quickly. If they start doing like sponsored posts or things that are coming from a different, a different origin, you're like, ah, that's not you. And the same thing happens with brands, right? Like if a brand suddenly starts preaching something that's not consistent with its brand identity, you can smell in a heartbeat. Look how we punish hypocrisy in terms of any, any public figure. The moment it looks like they're, they're straying away from their core values, it's kind of over for them. And so I guess like relating it back to me, like I'm terrible at single stocks. Like I learned that relatively quickly. Like I'm, I'm awful at macro. Like, you know, these two like absolute like critical pillars of the financial markets, I'm just not good at. And if I, and if I was quite good at it, God, how many more people are better than that at me? like almost everyone, right? And I spend a lot of time trying to find who the best macro and single stock guys are, right? It's not me. So I was like, all right, what can I do that I think I'm better than average at? And it's this kind of obsessive synthesis between often like weird spiritual stuff, complex adaptive systems, and really big picture views. And that was what I was interested in back to my undergraduate days. Getting me to accept that I was good at that was actually sort of the the basis of my crisis that I couldn't believe that that skill had value. But now I've just kind of thrown my hands up and, and rolled with it. The work has gained quite a bit of momentum in a way that's really surprised me. So that, that sounds like, that sounds like a, a business strategy for the launch of a sub stack, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you tie that to a, you know, a director of communications role for a, an advisory team? Yeah. Um, I guess that everything is everything. Right. Like if if you think that what I'm writing about is not relevant to people managing generational money, I would argue that it is because like, you know, the, the things I'm thinking about in terms of the flows of the global network or the global phase change or any of these things, if you're operating on a decade time frame as we are and as our clients definitely are like that, that's relevant information. Um, and you know we have we have great investors on our team that that do actual investing. And for me, it's more about you know the clients of ours that are interested in 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 broader topics and sometimes sort of more holistic topics. You know what's interesting is that you know once you've once you've really got up to the top of Maslow's hierarchy, you want to you want to understand how things extend slightly wider. And that's why a lot of the speakers that I booked for our speaker series have been people that are very unusual in the way that they think, but think in ways that I think are quite holistic and have application specifically to the financial markets, but also far beyond them as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree. I think there's, there's a, there's a vacuum of, I don't know what you call it, sort of gestalt thinking, right. Um, where, you know, you've, you've got all this information, you've got the hierarchies, you've got the structure, you've got the process, you've got, you know, the bullet points. Um, but I think people really crave content that helps to bring purpose and meaning or context to 
to that structure, right? I think that of all of the of all of the the gaping holes in modern life, right? I think that is sort of the meta gaping hole, right? Like people are looking for meaning, right? Phil Brick's like biting his tongue over there <laughs> on, on, on the gaping hole metaphor. But anyways, the, the, uh, like, I, I, I kind of feel like maybe that is a, that is a niche that really needs to be filled. And I, and I think you are doing a great job of, um, you know, of, of moving in that direction. Yeah. And you use the M word. And so don't get me bloody started. Because this is, I think, the most interesting thing in the world. Um, there's a great podcast series. Uh, it's no resolve, but it's uh, it's called Rebel Wisdom. And they did a great podcast a few weeks ago where they were like, oh, what's gone wrong? And a lot of people can point to like systemic issues. And then when you're like, all right, how do you fix them? Uh, and you just get shruggy shoulders emoji or something overly complex and thinky, right? Mm -hmm. And almost all of the most interesting people that I've encountered have identified the problem as being this, this lack of connection to something transcendent or sacred or Taoist or whatever you want to call it. There's a million mm -hmm. words. In the they're all absolutely terrible um, because they're trying to express something that can't be expressed. But the sensation of meaning is achieved when people are perfectly straddled, straddling this, this phenomenon of order and chaos. Right. And, if you're if you're not connected back to something transcendent, you're going to be in these kind of infinite loops of intellectual disconnectedness that that you you'll just get stuck in. And you know, I I, I wrote last week that you know the age of intellect typically precedes uh, a civilization's collapse because you get maximally disconnected from your environment. Um, and weirdly, as I was writing my, my most recent piece that's been driving me insane, you know, someone sent me uh, a podcast by a Holocaust survivor called um, Arnold Vandenberg, a great value investor. And he was talking about the relationship between what he, you know, what he calls character and values and investing in the sense of like, you have to be tethered to something and that something has to be relatively objective. So the way that, that I've been thinking about it, because you know I've become a, a big fan of, of Taoism as sort of a, a guiding principle, is that you use rationality and Bayesian analysis to get the clearest possible view of the present, which is actually really, really hard to do in a world that's like just too full of, of varying opinions. So you get a very, very clear view of, the, of, of what's on the ground. Again, in finance, almost impossible to do. And then you understand what the propensity of the system is. And what guides you through the propensity of the system that you have to realign yourself with them. Um, who's, yep. whose dog is that? It must be Richard. Richard is your poor dog whining, bro. <laughs> poor puppy. Um, he absolutely is. Sorry. Maybe I'll just let him join. Maybe I'll just let him join the, yeah, the just show. Just open the him. door. Let him. Come cool. In. My kids were going to get involved in this, but no, it's Richard's dog. Yeah, Pick him up him and in. put him on your lap, man. Oh, there he there is. You go. Oh. <laughs> Look, come on, bring him up so everyone can see him. <laughs> Let's let Tom get back on it. He's uh, he's jumping up. Okay, fine. There we go. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you do. I I I'm, I like how you sort of um, interweave the sacred and the profane and and this and a lot of the sort of concepts from. Um, from Taoism, for example, into into your writing, um, it sort of it it seems to intersect with or interface with maybe a, some of the stuff that um, Daniel Schmachtenberger talks about, um, John Ravicki, right? Um, I, I went from sort of Schmachtenberger, which is which seems a lot more sort of about um, about process thinking, structure. Um, a taxonomy for how to think about meaning, but doesn't seem to connect to the, to the underlying motivation of, of why people are seeking meaning. Right. And so I've, I've recently really gotten into some of the stuff from John Brevecki where he, where he talks explicitly about the, 
the deep seated need for a connection to the to the sacred and the and the profane and and how that guides people towards tribalism and 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 sort of um, connects that to what we're observing in our political process recently and the nihilistic approach that we see in in markets and in so many dimensions of life. Um, are, are these themes? I, I think these are also themes that you have been really passionate about exploring. Are you are you continuing to move in that way? So uh, who do you think uh, presented a live event that I went to on Wednesday? One of the people, hence named. <laughs> John Bavecchi. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so awesome. I've literally I've literally spent the last two days going going super deep into his work because um, initially I'd, I'd been like, it sounds too thinky because I'm very resistant now to the idea of um, – of intellectual solutions to sacred and spiritual problems because that's just like using a flamethrower to put out a forest fire it's just like well yeah yeah guys let's double down um schmachtenberger i i think he talks better and more interestingly than most people on these topics the dance of the Tao and the Ten Thousand things article that he wrote is one of the best things i've read in the last two Agreed. years because yep. yeah, yeah i'm glad you read it um but he I mean, who am I to criticize? But he often like seems to be one of those guys that then talks about systemic intervention without and, and sort of infinite games without necessarily understanding that this is this is a connection problem. Um, so in the synchronicities of the last few days, um, or like five days ago, one of my friends sent me a, an interview with a guy called Philip Shepard. Um, who I've encountered a couple of times before, and I, I popped it on my Twitter. Um, and basically, um, well, let's think about George Soros, right? Let's 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 go back to the markets. So I th I've been thinking a lot about George Soros's back pain, right? Uh, which is like one of those market cliches, right? Um, and to those of you who, who mystifyingly wouldn't have heard of it, but it's like you know, George Soros could give all these really clever ex ante reasons for why he uh, why he made a trade, and then his son was like, actually, it's all bullshit. It's because his back starts hurting. Um, and I was like, well, that's really funny. And is that because he's got sort of like this mystical ability? that comes from his back. And then I thought about it a lot and I was like, well, actually it's probably just pattern recognition, right? That he's, he spent so long trading and is so attuned to the market that he has this pattern recognition system running in the background all the time, but because it's not running in your intellect, because it would be too demanding for you to constantly be doing that. When something trips it, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel it first. You're going to get your back's going to hurt. And then if you're really, really, really smart, and this is the bit that I think people haven't thought about, or at least I hadn't, was like, you know what the back pain means? Because otherwise he's sitting at his Bloomberg and be like, ah, oh, my back really hurts today. Whereas if he's smart enough to be like, oh, my back hurts because my portfolio is not yeah. positioned well, that interpretation of dissonance, I think is, is maybe the most interesting part of that. And the Philip Shepard interview was like, all of our thinking happens in the head, but all of the flowing with the world happens in the body. And if you can find a way to unite that connection, your pattern recognition skills and your interpretation of those patterns are going to be very, very high. And Vivecki was basically talking about that in this amazing interview that I was listening to yesterday, where he's like, everyone worships intuition until it becomes prejudice. You know, you see someone from a race you don't like and you make a judgment about them because your pattern recognition is flawed, right? But when intuition is really well honed and you've got a great filter, again, to the Neurotrounders point, right, you become George Soros, where you've seen so many patterns and you can interpret it the right way when you see them. And I think that's like a really interesting idea. I think this dovetail, dovetails really nicely with uh, one of the uh, themes that you and I kind of exchanged emails on, which is the idea of the difference between the brain hemispheres. Hmm and how this may inform the uh, logical versus the more intuitive side of one's mind. Uh, I wonder if you might speak a little bit to that and how that may uh, inform the way that we can kind of draw these connections from the broad to the specific and vice versa and, and, and draw from one's intuition to, to that, you know, stuff that's running in the background to sort of more actionable steps. Yeah. Yeah. Even 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 the connectedness. How does one become more aware of the sorrows connection? My back hurts. Sell everything, right? Especially in a intellectually overpowered world where people are overthinking in order to impress, and then now we're bringing in spirituality via you know some connectedness to your inner self, 
which is at odds with, you know, sort of the talking heads in the, in the industry, so to speak. So how do you, mm. how do you square all of that? I know that's a lot, especially with what Richard said, but I think it, it is sort of relevant. Yeah. And uh, uh, how do you square all that in this, in this, in this particular domain, which is particularly skewed to the uh, more logic side of the hemisphere? Well, Mike, I'll, t- I'll tackle that one first because I've got a more immediate answer. And I'm, I'm a hypocrite. Um, I don't do enough embodiment practice. You know, I don't do yoga. I have a perennial source of, of, of guilt that I don't. And, you know, like, I, like, every, like every finance bro, I take my cold showers every morning. I don't do the Rim Hof breathing, but I have. But, like, you know, there's a, there's a fairly long list of well-accepted um, embodiment practices that people get into with, with various different degrees of success. I think there are some interesting other angles to look at. Um, and the first is resonance. And something Vandenberg said is he realized relatively early in his life that quotes were the way his subconscious communicated with him. Um, that he, when he read a quote that was resonant, he saved it. And then he, he assembled a book of 5,000. And I did the same thing uh, about four or five years ago. And it had a staggering, staggering effect on my life where I basically just put together a 50 page PDF and tied them together. And I realized it was me that was tying the quotes together in, an, in sort of much the same way as that when I was writing a piece for Wall Street that was just a list of, of, of disconnected insights. When I started tying those insights together, I started tying myself together. So I think that's one way to think about things is to really reflect on what you found resonant. In fact, that was what Nietzsche said as well, is that if you survey all the things that have ever moved your soul, you might find yourself in that connection. So that's sort of one intri- one like really interesting and I think reasonably specific prescription. Another one which um, which you know came out of John Cleese's latest book on creativity is is really boundary periods. That um, if your ability to interpret the stimulus correctly in a Soros sense is what's important, then the longer you send it, spend at a liminal period, the better you're going to get at interpreting those unconscious signals. So for Edison, it was he would go to he would go to sleep with a ball bearing in his hand. And, you know, he would wake himself up when he dropped the ball bearing so he could spend even longer in the liminal phase. And now I'm in a fundamentally creative role. I have this annoying habit of waking up at 5 a.m. with 700 insights that tie together all the things that I've been assembling for the previous week. And it happens almost every morning. When I turn on the cold shower in the morning, I'll get another flood of insights. Medium pace runs are also really good because you're ruminating, but you're also embodied. So you have good interplay. So like if you can find a liminal space that works for you, it seems to sort of strengthen that connection where you can get more and more unconscious input and you can get what Adam was saying in terms of that middle line of meaning where you're uniting the hemispheres, which then takes me into answering Rich's question. Um, And obviously this idea is stolen from Ian McGilchrist. Um, I get in lots of long arguments on Twitter about this work because I'm obviously not a brain scientist. So, if you, if you want to take issue with the brain science, read his book and then read his incredibly spectacular 29 rebuttal, 2019 rebuttal of everyone that went after the book. Um, and I don't care. I don't care about any of it because the metaphor in the book is so good and I think true, but it doesn't need to be true in order for it to be stunningly effective. And I think where it applies to the stock market is really simple, but really, really interesting which is sort of this whole ship of Theseus idea that basically the whole world is always flowing and that's the world of the right hemisphere. But the left hemisphere's job is to divide it up into categories so that it can be communicated and manipulated. But in a world where the left hemisphere is overwhelmingly dominant, which you see through grid-like cities, digital abstraction, the emphasis of safety over vitality in almost every part of our culture, you basically have everything focused on the abstract categories. So like you know, the, the example I used, I loved um, Pettis and Klein's book, Trade Wars or Class Wars. Um, and they basically talked about how people didn't really understand the nature of capital flows within a closed system in that labor reforms in Germany were a butterfly effect that would end up causing a housing crisis in the U.S., and that basically people would export excess savings and that would drive down lending lending practices in Florida and everything would cascade from there. And, and that's sort of something that, that I've been writing about really for the last four weeks with well, no, four months with you know limited success, but understanding ways the world flows and where those bottlenecks are going to come up, because now we've networked everything together 
there's going to be insane amounts of money won and lost in anticipating the bottlenecks, right? And like, it's obvious. Like, like just look at look at the supply chain. Like, you know, nobody wins anything for that, right? Like, but look at all of these different areas where the network flow is really influencing the prices of things, and people are still, you know, like, as I said, I'm not a macro guy, but like all day i'm like oh the fed's printed a bunch of money that's going to end really badly i'm like well done you, like, that's a, that's a great observation but also like what are all the other central banks doing what are the, what are the capital flows from taiwan into the us doing are you just looking at the us in isolation and wondering how everything's going to go terribly wrong here and i'm sure like like great macro traders are looking at this whole situation and laughing at it and being like you haven't found the butterfly back in the system that actually means something rather than just looking at all these individual countries in isolation which clearly isn't how anything works anymore yeah, I think, I think you, you, you really hit on the crux of something and just sort of, again, tying it back to the world of finance. I mean, you can almost characterize the CFA program, um, your typical MBA program, your master of finance program. All of them can be, can be sort of characterized as um, under the category of the theology of reductionism, right? Like, how can we... How can we distill all of these complex moving parts into it, it, the constituent components, analyze the constituent components, forecast the constituent components individually, and then and then rebuild the model in order to, to forecast the whole, not realizing that all of the inter individual components have interaction effects with one another and with the whole, and and so this is why it, it it just continues to baffle me. All of this concentrated effort on individual security selection without the context of what is the what is the macro environment like? What is the what is the dynamic system in which these these companies are operating? Right? What are the interaction effects between the companies in in a sector? and the competition and, and coopetition that's happening there between the companies and the regulatory apparatus or the political apparatus or the global trade apparatus or whatever, right? There's, these are, these end up being so vastly more important to the, the outcome of, or the ultimate objective, right? Which is, which is sort of wealth creation, but everybody focuses, it's like a lamppost problem, right? Like, why are you, why are you spending all their all your time here? Um, what, what's the lamppost metaphor, right? Um, it's the drunk wow. in the dark, yeah. And and he's wandering around because he's lost his keys, and somebody passes him under the the lamppost, and he's like, "What? Why? Are, what are you looking for? Oh, I'm looking for my keys. Oh, did you, or did you drop them by the lamppost? No, but this is where the light is, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it's the same kind of problem where. I, 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 you were trained in securities analysis, so this is where I'm going to spend all my time because the things that really matter are hard, right? And so I'm going to ignore those, even though they they matter far more because I know how to do this, right? Is is that a fair statement? Do you think, uh, Adam? If I could hug you right now, I would I would lean through the camera and hug you, <laughs> give you some sort of incredibly non-British hug. Um, I mean, to step back and go and go, go and go into the weird for a bit, because that's my favorite territory, right? Like, if I read one more sodding article about like, the only thing we read, need right now is just to be more rational, right? If everyone could dissect the problem and be as smart as me and, and make these observations, we would have no more problems, right? And that that is sort of everything that we do right now right and that again is trying to solve the problem we got into with the problem that created it which is if we're just a little bit more reductionist and we can put the, break this down into more and more discrete parts eventually it will be a solution and think about it this way there's a great quote that is to the effect of um if you divide the cow into more parts you're going to get more beef you're not going to get more cow Right. If you disrupt any complex adaptive system, you're going to kill it. You know, it's like Johnny Five in Short Circuit for anyone old enough. You know, he realizes quite early on that if he tears things apart, he kills them. And modern science and modern finance is unbelievably good at taking things apart. But then how do you turn the beef back into a cow? Well, that requires magic, right? Like quite literally, it requires magic. And 
know, I was reading about uh, shamanic cultures the other day, and it wasn't the breakdown that would characterize whether someone was become going to become a shaman. It was it was the nature of their reconfiguration afterwards, how they put themselves back together. And I think that relates to the point that I was making earlier, which is you need to put things back together according to the propensity of the system, which is that we need people who are able to connect to values, to understand the way the system is flowing and then align themselves with that in a harmonious way. And everything will work out much, much, much better. And you do that in an emergent way. Emergence is being on that middle line between order and chaos, right? Between embodiment and intellect. And once you're in that space, you can tell exactly where the system's going to flow and you become this sort of Druk, Soros-esque master trader, if that's your thing, where you can see the resonance of the system. And just to give a sort of a, a slightly less nonsense example, like I was chatting to um, a very seasoned investor two days ago and um, we are talking about his process and he was like, you know, I was researching this sub industry and I met a thousand management teams. And by the end of it, I just realized that this company was going to be the best one because I'd seen a thousand management teams because he has he can has that has that time frame. And I was like, well, yes, I've always heard management teams, management access is a really big thing for investors. And, you know, a lot of people take the piss out of it and they're like, oh, it's just because you're getting inside information or getting wink, wink nudge on the quarter or refining your model better, better than everyone else. I'm like. Maybe, but I've been in like a thousand management meetings and I've never heard that. It's more that if you're actually a really good investor, your pattern recognition for what a good, for what a management, a management team that is actually telling the truth is something you'll be able to tell because when someone is telling the truth, they sound different. They resonate, their body and their brains are aligned. And if you're good enough and have been in enough management meetings, you may not even know that you can hear it, but you will hear it and then you will be able to invest on that. And it's that kind of hybrid mentality that you see from a very, very small number of thinkers and investors that actually appears to be a defining characteristic. But to your point, Adam, it's, it's, it's very, very different from this endless reductionism that I think is actually kind of the route to madness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you spend a lot of time talking about complexity and emergence and how the really important things happen at the boundary between um, order and chaos, right? Um, and and I, I was struck by, and I forget ex exactly what the quote is. I feel like it was by Robert Oppenheimer. Um, but it was it was something to the effect of um, we have the we have the capacity to solve all of our problems so long as we don't um, try to direct it towards a certain objective or something. Do you do you do you know what I'm referring to? I quoted it last week. Jim O'Shaughnessy gave it to me, which is it's quite obvious that the world is going to hell. The only way it won't is if we don't prevent it from doing so. <laughs> right, right. So did you see that, Mike? Because I would I would have thought Mike would have been that. like, oh I my God, that. this is my favorite yeah. quote, right? <laughs> Ever. I, yeah, I, I Jim, didn't, Jim, I didn't Jim crushed it. it. And I was like, I'm stealing that and putting that in my weekly because it was great. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that uh, I'm intrigued by that, right? But it it implies that that self-organizing systems will always converge on a solution that meets the objective of the of the agents in the system mm. right and there's there's a lot of really interesting examples where that where that's not the case like for example i think it's i think it's sea lions right so like if you go to, to greenland or you go to antarctica you've got these these sea lions the sea lions weigh weigh multiple tons why do they weigh multiple tons because the this, the sea lion that is able to battle and be successful in battling all of the other sea lions are ends up being the one that is able to reproduce with all the females, right? And so what that means is that over time, the sea lions have become just so massive that they can barely move, right? So here you have an, an evolutionary system that was successful in propagating more sea lions but the individual agents, the sea lions, probably are not happy in the way that that they're living, in the way that evolution sort of created their 
um, their biology. Another example, um, uh, antlers, right? So elk have these massive antlers and for elk, it's the same thing. Typically two male elk will battle for access to a female and, and typically the one with the largest antlers ends up being successful more often. And therefore large antlers is a trait that ends up being targeted and emphasized evolutionarily. But for the individual male elks, now they all walk around with these massive um, antlers, which are debilitating, right? They're, you know, they're just awkward and, and unwieldy and unpleasant, right? So I guess my point is, can you have a fully emergent solution without, without guiding towards an objective that seems to satisfy the, the objectives of the, of the underlying agents? So and this gets to something, and I know I'm sort of droning on here, but just to wrap, bring a sort of full circle, the last few weeks, especially, we've been having this conversation, Mike keeps sort of raising this idea of moral presumptiveness, right? And, and I think it sort of ties in, like the idea of moral presumption is, I think that there is a, a compass that we need to sort of focus on to help nudge the, the system in certain directions that have a higher probability of manifesting in a solution that benefits the agents, right? If it's purely emergent, we have no idea whether that whether we're going to converge on a solution that actually benefits the agents. So I'm going to I'm going to throw that out there. Anyone can react to that. I think you've hit something staggeringly profound again. Um, so Morgan Housel wrote something the other day. Uh, I think it was Amos Bursky who said that you know you you waste years by not being able to waste hours, right? And one of the one of the fundamental problems of our existing system is that we assume that running at a hundred percent and maximum profitability and maximum evolution is the optimal outcome. Whereas actually, if you look at nature, you end up with people with, you know, deer with antlers so big that they can't move, right? It's an incredibly maladaptive strategy to run at hundred percent. And when we relate it back to our own lives, like obvious that's the case because look around Manhattan, right? People just falling apart, right? So you have the paradox where in order to evolve best, you actually have to have an extremely balanced evolution where you you don't you don't you know excel in any one area and i think that that sort of paradoxical intent actually also relates back to to the systemic intervention um which again goes back to taoism because it's super embarrassing that i realized that they worked everything out like three thousand years ago um but the taoist sage becomes so congruent with the system by being completely himself, that he makes weeny tiny little nudges. So he does have agency, right? He has a goic agency, but completely in harmony with the system that nudges it into a way that's intrinsically desirable, right? And that kind of is this, this existence that's complete anathema to the Western uh, mentality. And I always think of the this, this basketball player, Shane Battier, who I think I'm saying his name right, but like, they worked out that he had the same plus minus effect on the court as an all-star, but would go through most games without scoring a point. Because basically he was so congruent with the system, he knew exactly where to force Kobe to reduce his shooting percentage the most. Everyone got better when he was on the court, like to a ludicrous, ludicrous degree, but he had absolutely no standout statistics. And it's sort of that idea of congruence, like Battier rather than Jordan, and there's roles for both, that I think is sort of this system Systemic improvement that we can make, and there's um, there's a really interesting idea about um, the nature of the individual within that context, uh, and sort of the individual as the butterfly in the storm, where the Taoist sage operates as that butterfly and has this systemic cascading impact that's incredibly positive. Maybe he doesn't even ever know it. And I think about um, you know Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who basically used his time in the Gulag to purify his soul. And then he comes out and it's like, you know, the one thing I'm not going to do is participate in the lie. So he writes the Gulag Archipelago and it brings down the Soviet Union, or at least contributes in a very significant way to bring you down the Soviet Union. So you have this guy, he operates outside of the paradigm. He comes back into the system and is like, guys, this is bullshit. Here's the truth, big T truth. And the system gets reconfigured. So when you think about that in terms of a fitness landscape, that's kind of the heroic role of this person that can step outside the paradigm and be like, guys, here's a new paradigm. And suddenly the whole landscape readjusts to that. 
Yeah, it's a it, it's an interesting starting point, right? I'm sort of reminded of um, who was it? The the chief investment officer of Transcrend brought my attention to the fact that a flock of birds. So think about migrating birds, right? So they're 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 migrating thousands of miles, whatever. May, oftentimes, many miles out to sea, barely in you know, often not really in line of sight with the coastline. Um, somehow, they're able to orient well enough. This thousands of birds orient well enough to get from A to B and back again every year. And what the the scientists were able to determine was that it was sufficient for a number of birds equal to the square root of the total population of birds in the flock at any given moment in time to have a sense of the direction that the, the that they should go like some pattern memory or something that recognizes where they are right now and nudges the flock in that direction the square root of the total population if that's that number knows then the flock can get from a to B successfully, right? Again, this 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 sort of nudging phenomenon of just like a small number of individuals within the group, as long as there's even a small number that have that are moving in a direction that is that is constructive, then the whole population has a good chance of of getting there, right? So so I I like this idea of the individual acting in uh, congruence with the complexity of life and through their seeking their own truth, everybody's seeking their own truth, but together it becomes this emergent phenomenon that, that brings us in the, the right direction, right? The hiccup in that, I, I think in the modern era is that it requires agents to have an instinct be, or be able to rely on their own internal programming to make decisions. But in the modern era, we are being constantly be reprogrammed by a force that is so asymmetrically larger than ourselves, right? Namely the, the Facebook content direction algorithm or the YouTube content direction algorithm or Twitter. How do we, how do we successfully rely on that emergent individual agent phenomenon in a time where all individual agents are being hypermanaged by forces that are vastly asymmetrically large relative to the individual. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm less, I'm less down on this whole idea. I mean, part of me is like, you know, weird idea alert again, but like it is incredible that we've ramped up these weapons of mass distraction at exactly the moment when it seems like we're on the cusp of a global consciousness shift. Like if there was some sort of like, you know, Skynet working against us and it, and you know, the whole usual suspects thing about like the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing us he doesn't exist. Like if you were a super evil AI hell bent on preventing humanity from coming to consciousness, could you have invented a better system than the one you currently have? <laughs> like probably not. But like, I think, I mean, that being said, I, uh, to counterbalance it, like I get a huge amount of value from Twitter, like a huge amount of value from Twitter. And I think it, I, I, if you're if you're not getting value from Twitter, you're using it wrong. Um, I don't I'm not on any other social media platforms because they're bounded, right? They're bounded by the friends that you have and the advertising they want you to see. Whereas if you can if you can curate Twitter, it becomes like unbelievably valuable. And I think you have to be quite aggressive with who you curate. Um, I do believe again, one of the stranger beliefs that I have that now gets completely vindicated by my lived, my lived experience is that the environment that we're in is benign and the environment we're in um, wants to provide us with, with the tools to evolve ourselves through our own information landscape. We navigate our own information landscapes exactly on the DAO when we're doing it right basically following our interests we don't we don't read things that we don't understand and we don't read things that are too easy because they're not interesting so if you can really respect that instinct of your own attention and your own interest and not doom scroll 
I think you're going to get like massive, massive amounts of value from just information full stop because you'll basic, you, you'll literally be evolving through it, right? There's no other way to see it because if you're continuously, if you're continuously on the balance beam when you consume information, you have no alternative but to evolve your understanding of something. It's interesting. It seems sounds like you're you're threading this line between dystopia and and sort of a quasi techno optimism which is similar to to what some of the writing uh some of your writing that i've uh experienced kind of threads that line and and, and tries to, to to not go too down on, on on some of the directions that we see that we're going and 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 some of the issues that we're just we're talking about here the uh Informa uh, the information overload that we're experiencing and the uh, age of intellect preceding the uh, downfall of civilization as you've uh, described. How do you thread that line? How do you find the uh, the, the balance not to get too down on, on some of the directions that we, we, we all can kind of almost grasp at the, the, the whole Skynet uh, uh, analogy that you drew? I'm actually incredibly optimistic. I've never been more optimistic in my life. Um, I, I, one thing I find really interesting is that bad science fiction tends to be linear, right? It's like, it's today, but shit, right? Like, it's it, it's today, but with worse climate change or no fertility or robots killing each other, right? Like, whereas the really interesting um, sci-fi, like Arrival um, and Looper and, you know, Interstellar and the stuff that I really like, it has intervention from out of time. It has intervention from a different source. And my crazy theory right now that I'm increasingly thinking might actually be right is we're about to undergo a hemispheric pivot as a society. And I think I think the the super mega crazy viral success of something like a squid game points to that in the sense of like people realize that these hyper Darwinistic systems that result in, you know, deer with antlers that are too big and these debt these debt ridden structures with which create super inequality where an elite just makes everyone else compete to die like that story does not go viral unless it's resonating with like everyone it goes number one in 90 countries apart from denmark which i found hilarious right like it it means something uh, and I, I believe that like adamantly and i think it's this this emergent phenomenon and I was talking to um, one of the younger geopolitical strategists who I really like, a guy called Marco Papic at Clock Tower. And he has this idea called the Buenos Aires Consensus, which is basically that DM electorates are moving. Basically, po politicians talk a lot, right? But they actually eventually move in the direction of their median voter. And median voters in most of the unequal countries, not all of them, right? Not all DMs are unequal, but most of, them, uh, most of the unequal DM countries, electorates are like, screw it, intervention, fiscal stimulus, don't care about small government anymore. Just print, keep me happy. And you know, like I appreciate money for nothing is not everyone's not everyone's cup of tea, and it will the system will get refined. But I see all these emergent phenomena right now that people get very worked up about because they're irrational. But like NFTs, a bubble where artists are making as much money as speculators. That's a bit weird. ESG, weird incentives not being done very well, but a situation where externalities are being incorporated into market prices. Huh, that's weird. That's like a, a non a, like a systemic move. Blockchain and crypto, decentralization of networks back to the edges of the network. Huh, that's kind of weird. Like all of these things that look dumb because they're irrational, people don't understand that evolutionary shifts always look irrational because if they look rational, they'd be intellectual. And if they were intellectual, they wouldn't solve any problems. So I'm super, super optimistic. Whether the transition is going to be smooth, like I super doubt it. You know, there might be a, there might be a dark night of the soul for society, but I think we're moving, we're moving in the direction to Adam's point. We're moving in the direction of meaning and transcendence. It's just going to be difficult. Uh, in the direction of that society, um, I wonder, there's two ways to go. So one, one I think about is, okay, you're going to have a smaller and smaller sect of the population actually creating value and, um, garnering the, uh, economic value from that. And so what do we do with the rest of society, right? So if you, if you think about, you know, a UBI free money type discussion, what's interesting and what, uh, one of our fellow, um, um, employees here, Alexi put to me, he's like, well, what do we do with people who have an IQ of 80, right? They're not productive in our society. 
And that's a that's a great question, except now 80 is becoming 90, is becoming 110, is becoming not just the domain of intelligence, right? There's EQ, IQ, there's the physical uh, laborer of, of the industrial revolution, right? So there's, there's a whole bunch of dimensions that can make people useful or not useful. And what do we do as power laws come into the economic value clustering at the top? What do we do with the rest? But then when I hear you talk about these, well, does everyone just play some video games and swap some stuff at home so they kind of pretend that they're working uh, or feel like they're working because we keep a bunch of stuff in place to shift some papers around so they feel like they're working? Like now we're in this 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 cage, but we don't know we're in the cage. Yeah, yeah and then Dave just, Nadig also raises the point that um, the the elite then get at, will will get early access to biological jacking, right? So biohacking, et cetera, that mm. will allow them to the bifurcation. Alter. Yeah. They're gonna have the biggest antlers on the on the walrus out there. <laughs> until they can't move. Until they can't move. Yeah. Until they can't move. They are welcome to their biohacking. Like the idea that like you know when they, they release like GM mosquitoes in Florida and they're like, oh, I, I see no way this goes wrong, right? Like I've never <laughs> seen Jurassic Park, right? Like the idea that people are going to use like Gen 1 biologics to alter their physiology in a system where we don't understand any of these systems. Yours, buddy. You think that's going to work out really well? Cool. Like uh, if you want to do that, that's great. And and part of that is also like, you know, the the billionaire on HGH that won't accept his own mortality and, and, and is building a sort of billionaire lifeboat into space or whatever it is, right? It's like, these are all, these are all like substitutes for transcendence in many ways. And I think that, yeah. like, of course, I don't have any good ideas to your question, Mike, because then I'd be running a country. But two things I would say is that, like, I love the fact that you bring up IQ, because our society's worth is basically determined on a metric that is also the cause of all of our problems. Well, not all of our problems, but yeah. the extremities of our current problems. The yeah. idea that people's productivity is based on their intellect is is sort of super interesting to me. And like, I think about you know the the relative quote unquote failure of indigenous cultures to integrate into our society. I'm like, do they regard it as a failure? Right. Like, right. like, like, you know, the, the Sebastian Younger made this point that, that, um, it, you know, American settlers would defect to, uh, to the tribes, uh, to the Native American tribes, um, and the Native Americans would defect to the, to the settlers and the Native Americans all came back and the, the Native Amer and the American settlers never came back from the tribes. Right. They, they basically found that, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to romanticize the noble savage, but there is something about other ways of living where you're much more you're much more transcendently connected to your body and to the world around you and you're not just judging iq as the as the entire determinant of someone's worth that might also be part of this emergent shift the obvious rebuttal to that is cool is that's a bit utopian and bullshit. and also like this probably just ends up as a power law where you know Taylor Swift or whoever it is has all of the plays in the creator economy. And if you're create, if you know, if my writing's not very good, it won't circulate very far and I won't be able to make a living off it. And I don't believe that everyone can be a creator because you may not have the experience that's relevant to that. And there may not be an audience for you. I don't believe that everyone has a thousand true fans. And so that is super problematic. And I think a lot about like, I got in a big argument with a hedge fund founder a few weeks ago because he was like, feckless millennials, money for free. Can be like telling me, telling people about their emotions in the workplace. And I was like, you haven't thought about this at all, have you? You really haven't. Like, if your kid was. It's the boomers that are benefiting from the money for free oh. and the massive <laughs> pump. It's the guy who's probably a boomer who owns the hedge fund shop. Well, no comment. Who, um, who the, who's the one who's saved themselves several times as financial assets have collapsed by robbing their grandchildren who happen to be millennials and Gen Z? Let's get the record straight. But it's not even about that. It's about, <laughs> it's about what do you do? It's about if you graduated right. from college right now, like if you were like, all right, I've got a kid and I want them to have a 10 year long career in something. What is that 10 year long career going to be? And anyone that has an opinion on that should spend three months trying to get that job on LinkedIn, where they're going to get kicked in the groin a hundred times a day with rejections, however smart they think they were. 
and when I was when I was in transition and career basis, you know, like I've got I've got some nice box ticking on my resume, and I just ended up getting rejected from inappropriate jobs for months on months on end. And it made me much more compassionate to the idea that like it's very 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 difficult for people twenty years younger than me right now to determine direction in a way that's going to sustain them. And so, of course, they're focused on experiences because they look at a, a whole, an, an older generation that got to the destination and looked around and was like, is this all there is? And so I, I think that you know, what we should be doing as a society is, is thinking, about, thinking about ways that we can position employment. And the only answer that I've come up with, which I think is, is very suboptimal, is sort of local knowledge work, right? Like the, the, the small town lawyer. Or whatever it is, people that can people that can ma maintain white collar employment in a localized way, because anything globally fungible is going to get disrupted down to ten dollars an hour by Upwork, right? And and anything that's blue collar, our college graduates probably don't want to do it, and that's fine, you know. And a lot of people frown on that, but like if you were in the same position, would would you want to go and clean toilets? Would you want to go and pick fruit? And and I, I just think it's a very very hard conundrum to solve. Well, I think there there's an area of growth. I know in my neighborhood back in Toronto, the, the all the sports cars were the, the HVAC plumbers and electricians, because the the toolboxes in all those houses was a check and a pen, back in the check and pen days. Um, so it's interesting, <laughs> right? It's the it's the localized economy. Like who's going to fix? I can't have a guy from India fix my electricity. I yeah. need a local guy, and the you know the the more wealthy the environment is, the the more expensive the various trade is. So it, that, that localized employment is, is a really, it, it's not, that's not going to be arbed away anytime soon. The local lawyer is an interesting one. I mean, you know, you, you do sort of see as you, as you get older and age and have traveled from town to town, you do see that those local economies on the white collar side. And I don't know how, when I, that evolved in my mind, but it, it's always an interesting thing. I'm like, well, why is, you know, the local coffee shops now been replaced by Starbucks and Tim Hortons. And so these types of mega corporations are invading Walmart, obviously put all kinds of businesses that were local, uh, emptied the old downtown. So do we, I guess we just have new economies that come like, we don't need to regress. We'll just, something new will come up. Mm -hmm. We'll all play chess against one another and get paid, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> But that's what yeah. people say Web3 is, right? Like it's total yeah. decentralization of everything. And I can't work out whether it's nonsense or not, right? Because it, what's actually happening on the ground is very difficult. You know, I met someone the other day that was explaining to me that, um, you know, Amazon third-party selling, which is all relatively small fry people, is a $200 billion GMV market growing into 50% Kager, right? That's people, that's people in the middle classes, right? You know, YouTube. 55% of the economics goes to the creators. There are robust, there are robust subsectors being created within the platforms that are maybe bridges to an individual creator economy. But I love the framing from Chris Dixon of in web 2.0, your margin was my opportunity. And in web 3.0, your take rate is my opportunity. The businesses are going to compete to provide better economics to entrepreneurs, creators, and small businesses. Again, maybe it's utopian, but it does seem to be happening on an emergent basis right now. I mean, one thing, one quality that characterizes, has always characterized the creation community, right? Whether it's artists or authors or whatever. Um, I mean, there are no uh, work communities or very, very few career directions that have such a Pareto distribution type um, uh, set of outcomes, right? Like, you know, the top 1% of authors capture 95% of total book economics, right? The same thing for, um, for songwriters and, yeah. and, you know, performing artists and actors and et cetera. Right. So, I mean, I, I like the idea that, that artists are now be able to go sort of direct to market rather than going through auctioneers or dealers or whatever. But I don't think that it solves the problem of, the fact that the wealth will will consistently concentrate at the top, and this is this is a an emergent phenomenon of of the system, right? You, mm -hmm. The and and it's it's partly the distribution of talent, but I think even more, it's a function of sort of of mimesis, right? Like I don't know if you, you probably 
heard about this experiment. I think it was at Yale or anyways, one of the big universities, but they set up this music sharing service. Yeah. And they, um, and, and they gave access to two different groups in one group. They did not interfere with the ranking algorithms of the content. They just let the ranking kind of emerge. Actually, they had like several different groups where they did not interfere with the ranking, right? And then they had several groups where they did interfere with the ranking. And what they found was that in each of the different individual groups where they didn't interfere with the ranking, they all came, the the top ranked content was completely different across each of the the, the separate um, groups. Okay, so a, a different group of people won the content lottery in each of those emergent systems, right? Um, but the concentration of downloads still conform to an extreme Pareto distribution. So, you know, again, five percent of all artists got yeah, it was it was an emergent of all downloads, right? Emergent conditions. Uh, that affected sort of the, the, um, oh God, the, uh, the cascading effect that continued. And what was interesting is the talent or the thing that was the most popular was different in all of them. Yes, exactly. And in the, just, just to close a loop and in the group where the researchers control the algorithm, they set the initial conditions so that certain artists, got slightly more attention than the other artists. And, and they were astonished at how little a nudge of extra attention that they were, they needed to give to these artists to catapult them to the very top of the distribution. Right. So like it's people, it's the, it's the crowd watching the crowd. Mm-hmm. And the, it's the crowd watching the crowd that determines what well, is popular. Isn't it right? the tribalism, right? Isn't that the whole point of the the human condition, right? And yeah. mem- mimetic desire, I think, is the yeah. uh, is yep. the terminology that's been thrown around. I think Corey just, just cited the uh, the study there by Duncan Watts at Columbia on if you can pull that up. I love yeah, I love was, that face talk. <laughs> you got you got you got to give us give us your take on it. No, I I can't annoy Gerard Twitter again. I got in a big argument this week with everyone, just being like, "What actually is important about Rene Girard's work?" Because I've tried to read it and I don't get it. And it's just like, yes, I've got a toddler. He wants other toddlers' toys without realizing he wants them. Cool. <laughs> like uh, if you've got a toddler you now understand Rene Girard um so I think I'm missing something and I got in a big argument with hundreds of people telling me I was missing something but I don't want to I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because I think I want to I want to go back to um to what you were saying Adam because I think that we're and I don't want this to be a cop-out Mike I really don't but I think we're in danger of making a very bad mistake relative to everything else we've just said which is that we're sitting here performing like a valuable service of being like well isn't this all fucked and and how do we get around it and all of these other things whereas actually what we should be doing is looking back at what we've just discussed right which is the idea that understand where the system is right now very valuable but then also understand the propensity of the system because i've noticed that a very very clear symptom of depression is the idea of giving the intellect responsibility for more than it can handle. And the intellect can't actually handle very much at all. And actually, you know, people that have really concrete five year plans, like it's often a recipe for madness um, because things are going to unfold how they're going to unfold. And you need to be reactive to that unfolding. And the system has an intrinsic intelligence of its own, which I appreciate sounds strange, but I do believe it to be true. And so it becomes this issue where I watch particularly the younger generation look at all these cascading, catastrophic, systemic issues and be like, well, why haven't I solved climate change? Or like getting themselves into charitable positions where they're like, there's just so much for me to handle. I'm getting burnt out because I can't I can't save all the people. And I think the the really interesting, incredibly optimistic nuance from the sense of Taoism within this situation is there's just like you do you in that basically like, you know, I said recently, follow your bliss is the most misunderstood piece of advice ever because it makes it sound like it's easy. But if you can collapse your ego, 
which is probably going to be the worst experience of your life. And if you can, if you can relinquish your protections and all the things that are preventing you from being courageous and vulnerable enough to actually be creative. And I hate that word because it sort of brings to mind like finger painting. And I, I, I think creativity is different for everyone. For me, it's writing nonsense on the internet about complex adaptive systems, but it's literally different for everyone. It is different for everyone by definition. And finding out what that is, is going to be the work of a lifetime and very, very difficult. And we've discussed some ways to do that. But the idea being that if you find a way to become congruent with the system, there are no other problems because everyone's congruent with the system. And the idea that if you start sitting there being like, we can't solve this on a systemic level, you're ignoring the Oppenheimer quote, which is that like, if we try and intervene with this, we're going to screw it up. So I don't know, it sounds like a cop out, but I think it's a great way to live your life without stressing about all the squillion things that there are to stress about and will always be there to stress about. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, yeah, Mike, I'm sure that that resonates a little more with the way you, you view things, right? I, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, amen, brother. Yeah. Go ahead, Adam, <laughs> you poor guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, it's just, a, I, I actually, I'm closer to that than, than I was, um, the sort of me connecting it to the sort of the bird analogy is kind of the way that I got there, but connecting what you said to that sort of bird analogy is kind of the way that I got there, but I'm hung up on the fact that we are no longer operating as agents in isolation because we, there is a mass limbic hijacking that is taking place that we have given permission to large organizations with sociopathic objectives, right? Like shareholder yield maximization, right? Sociopathic objectives to, um, to wreak havoc on our limbic system, right? So they're playing off our outrage, shame, guilt, um, rage functions the, uh, like the dopamine, primarily dopaminergic pathways to completely rewire our intuitions, our belief systems, our, the fundamental drivers of our agency. So in a, in a world that is dominated by those types of asymmetric dynamics, why should we expect the natural emergent phenomenon from individual agents operating in flow with their um, calling to be able to to nudge the the system towards converging on a solution that benefits everybody in the way that that manifests a destiny that benefits people in the way that they, we want to be benefited you ever seen viva vendetta yeah i haven't <laughs> uh, go watch it it's not a great movie um it's, but it's, it's a good movie. Uh, Philosophically, it's a very interesting. It's movie. a good reference. It's, it's a Wachowski movie, right? And yeah. uh, I think they they adapted it or something. But I, you know, always pay attention to the Wachowskis. Those guys know some shit, uh, guys and girl. Um, yeah. No, both it, girls now. Are they? Are they? They're both uh, girls now. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, thank you. So I, I'm probably going to ruin this for you, but okay, fine. Um, it's about a man who is masked and you've seen it at every like anarch being co-opted by every anarchist movement worldwide. You've seen the guy Fawkes mask everywhere, right? But the concept that it illustrates is that the prophet, one man telling the truth acts as a piece of sand in the sand pile that destabilizes something that's grown, that's grown too fragile, right? As squid game would imply that our system currently has, right? And so you sit here being like, everyone's listening to the crazy demagogue on TV during Viva Vendetta, and everyone thinks that everyone else is being limbically hijacked by TikTok. But we can all tell deep down that something is very, very, very wrong. And all it takes sometimes is one person coming out there and telling the truth, and everyone hears the truth, and the sample collapses. And I think you guys getting on a podcast and telling your truth. You don't know where the, the, the grain of sand is going to come from. But if you're like Solzhenitsyn in the gulag and you come out and you're like, the one thing I'm not going to do now is lie. I'm just not going to be a part of the lie. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to see outside of the paradigm and talk about it. That's all you can do. And I think that 
I worry, 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 worry a lot about the younger generation who don't have a foundation of pattern recognition to notice the limbic hijack. And I think it's, I think it's, it's sinister. And it's, it's, it's the, it's the kind of world the left hemisphere would build in this really crazy, like emergent, like negatively emergent way. And I do, it makes me like the mental health crisis amongst like particularly, you know, teenage girls, like just fills me with terror and raising, you know, now I have a four week old girl. Like it, I, I hope this, I hope this shit's all resolved in 18 years or in, well, in, in, in 11 years, you know, in seven years, however long it's going to take for her to get a, a clammy little hands on a smartphone. Um, but I do believe that the power of an individual actor or a group of actors and, you know, whatever the number is, like three and a half percent of a population can, cat ca can catalyze a shift in the entire population, which is the number that Instinction Rebellion always cite. At the bottom of Pandora's box is hope, right? And the reason why there's always hope is that in an iterated game, cooperation always wins, right? There's, the, you know, nature red in tooth and claw always loses to love nature's final law. And you you see that's the message from Squid Game. You see it's the message from all of our art. And I don't believe that's romantic nonsense. I believe that's actually the, the metaphysical structure of our reality. So I'm just not that pessimistic about it. I think the route is going to be very challenging. Did you see the... Um, there was a, a series done by the Wall Street Journal, and then it was... Um, but there was a series of reports and documents that were leaked by a whistleblower at Facebook recently. Mm. Right? I'm not, yeah. are you, did you see that? Were, are you familiar I paid, with that? I paid peripheral attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what struck me about that, just to your, just to your point about an individual speaking the truth, being able to change the world. Right. <laughs> what strikes me about that is that this woman revealed just some, just completely damning information. But perhaps unsurprisingly, her revelations weren't carried on Facebook. They weren't carried on, on Twitter. They weren't carried on, you know, like the, the most astonishing observation about this whole episode was that the truth that is inconvenient to this to the current status quo is not allowed to propagate. propagate. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dan Dresner has this great book called The Ideas Industry. There's basically Silicon Valley has all the money. So all the all the TED talks are all now are, are now all like techno utopianism where we're going to the singularity and the nerd rapture and all these things. Yeah, and right. I, do like, I do like that idea. But I, I also think this, right, which there's the Zen parable of maybe I'm sure you guys have heard that where like, yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the farmer's son's leg breaks and everyone comes to the farmer and says, that's really sad. And he says, maybe. And then the next day they come to conscript all the soldiers for the army and they don't take him because his leg's broken. And he just says, maybe every time. Right. And I think about Mike like, shares this, this parable about <laughs> once a year. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay. Well, I like Mike a lot. Um, <laughs> so maybe it, Maybe, yeah, maybe it has. Like, we don't know where in the butterfly effect we are at any one point of time because you can never disaggregate one thing from anyone else. That's the nature of systems. That's making the category error we were talking about. So we don't know when this is going to stop rippling. But maybe she's not the butterfly. Maybe it's Mike. Mike, maybe you're going to say something in the next 30 seconds. In fact, I'd like you to, that changes the entire world, right? Like, <laughs> it, it's um, no pressure. Uh, yeah. it, <laughs> It's like that idea that, yes, whatever she said didn't penetrate seemingly the veneer, but it doesn't mean that the next thing isn't going to. You know what I mean? And I, maybe I'm just being too optimistic and utopian about things, but I, I've just watched the way this operates. Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah, I, well, I think, I think <laughs> the, the, other, the other Categorically, thing is, yes. <laughs> the other thing is in, in the – the the Tao and and these types of things. There's no guarantee that humanity remains forever. In fact, that that's not a guarantee. The elk that has the too big a rack dies off to make way for the next iteration of the next animal that fills mm -hmm. that void in the journey of life. So so we sometimes get caught up in time frames. We want to make changes in this shorter time frame. We've had we've had discussions about religion as an example, and when you make decisions on the basis of 
being in business for 2000 years and expecting to be in business for another two or 10,000 years, depending on the religion that you're talking about, it changes the frame with which you would make decisions, right? You would, you would do things differently in that context. And so, you know, the time frame that you're thinking about the things that we are perceiving through our goggles of our reality. And then this right that we feel we have is this conscious entity, the human kind that we think we should persist or that the walrus should persist. No, the walrus gets too big. They all die. They get eaten by killer whales and something else takes its place. And that's actually the way it's supposed to go. That it's a long continuum of things that are evolving in the, the concept of life fighting the entropy of the universe. Well, yeah, there you, go. I, you, you asked for, you asked for the, um, that could be it. The enlightenment, that was it. Right? <laughs> that was it. I, I have just suddenly achieved Satori. Thank be, you, Mike. Be sanguine uh, with the eradication of the human race, which. <laughs> well, yeah, look at it another way, right? So, you know, the, you know, the, the Brian Murescu book, The Immortality Key, um, he it is going like semi-viral and he basically oh. talks about uh, the Eleusian mysteries where all of the elites at the time were inducted into this like ergot drinking um, secret. Psychedelic. Book. Yeah, where they'd basically die before they die. So they'd be like, all right, I've had some sort of ego death experience in psychedelia and now I'm not afraid of death. So I can just be a better steward of the world. And that plays into your point, Mike, of just basically being like, we've caused all this havoc essentially because we've over-indexed towards safety at the cost of vitality. And the consequence of that is, is that if you ever want to live your life even better, you have to have a degree of vulnerability and, and vitality that as a society we've been unwilling to embrace. So yes, we'll have to accept the fact that maybe it's not our place to be as quote unquote successful as we have been. But, and I think this is a point that Schmachtenberger makes really well, Adam, is that like regressive spirituality is like, just be in the moment and be like a kid and everything will be fine and bullshit. And then like enlightenment spirituality and spiritual bypassing is go sit on a lotus cushion and meditate yourself to enlightenment. And he's like, no, human adulthood is the ability that we have that's unique in the animal kingdom to co-create the Taoist sage, right? We can co-create and control the direction of our own evolution in a way that no other species on earth can, because we can do it consciously in timeframes that no other species can do, right? So that makes it, that makes it a choose your own adventure. So like, we don't have to be eradicated. We're probably gonna have to put more slack into the system, right? Like if you create a system that is optimizing for massive antlers it's going to break whether we want it to or not because that's the nature of those kinds of systems but we do get a choice so talk to i think this is a good segue to the theme that you have been um working on spending a lot of time on and you mentioned it earlier in in this conversation about phase transition or or um i forget the, the term change. you used for phase change yeah i'm not even sure so i'm using it right well, yeah, go for it. Tell tell us what is involved with that. It's just, it's all what we've been talking about. Really. So everything. is it just to clarify, is that is that the 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 boundary between order and chaos? Is that what you mean well, there or in, no? Yeah, we're in too much order. And the right, emergent okay. emergent systems all tip towards this state of greater and greater criticality. And yeah. whilst I'm absolutely not a physicist or even a particularly good complex system systems person, the metaphor I think of is the Kung Kalahari tribesmen in Africa where they basically dance and dance and dance and dance and dance until they get hotter and 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 suddenly their heart opens and they gain the ability to heal others, right? And I look at the world in July, the hottest month ever, the level of interconnection of a thousand fold increase in internet traffic, everything has become stupidly interconnected in a microscopic sliver of human history. Our brains are the most complex objects in the known universe and we've connected them to all the other brains across the entire world, right? It doesn't even make sense the scale and the speed with which it's happened doesn't make any sense. And that, from my idiot's understanding, tends to be what happens just before a phase change. But phase changes are non-linear. It's not that we're just going to extrapolate to the dystopian sci-fi of everything getting worse. My opinion, and it's just my opinion, and I'm a literal nobody, is that if you relay it back to the Ian McGilchrist book about the brain hemispheres, if his diagnosis of the problem is that we've become highly lateralized in the left hemisphere, in all the ways that we've just been talking about, the phase shift is taking us back the other way in this very irrational shift towards an emergent um, evolution that take that reconnects us to the transcendent. It's the Renaissance, baby. That's exactly the word. 
It's exactly the word. Someone sent me a great piece where, um, oh God, I'm going to, one river. Um, Peters. Eric Peters. Eric Peters. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So yeah, Eric Peters wrote a great piece with exactly the same thesis as mine. So obviously I'm not an original person. Um, basically talking about how this is an artistic renaissance. Um, but all of these terms like art, poetry, creativity, they're very, one, very easily denigrated in our society, to your point, Mike, about IQ being the be all and end all. But also, it, I think a lot of people, particularly in our line of work, look at that and think, well, I'm not creative. I certainly would have done. But it's about capturing that individual creativity. But the rub is that capturing that individual creativity involves relinquishing whatever the left hemisphere deems to be important. And that is safety, security, linearity, logic, language, all these different things. But if we're pivoting, the world's going to unfold in, in that way. There's a good, there's a good guy to read, um, Duncan Austin. Uh, he wrote a PDF called Can Economics Understand What Ecology Says? And Adam, it's exactly your point about the reductionism. We've gone to this point of di dissecting everything, and now we need to build it back up. And the process of building it back up is going to is going to require magic. Okay, just just to tie it back to, I mean, our audience skews is you know primarily sort of financial. Mm. So in for the thesis of phase change, which presumably is volatile, it's chaotic. Um, it requires well, risk taking. We're talking about disequilibrium, I think. Right? Is that like pretty substantial disequilibrium from one state to the next state. Yes. Okay. So what's the investment thesis for um, a, a world that is on the cusp of a phase change in the way that you define it? I think, I mean, this is going to be the work of the next five years, 10 years of my life is finding, you know, finding ways to capitalize on it. I think there's two different frameworks to look at. I think it's like looking at the continuation of all those emergent things that I talked about. Like at the moment, there's symptoms. So I wouldn't recommend any of them as like investment ideas, but like NFT, crypto, blockchain, ESG, um, political intervention towards more fiscal stimulus. If the phase change idea is right, you're going to have more stimulus all over the world because electorates are just going to increasingly demand it. So you have all of these things that are look irrational, but are going to become increasingly prevalent. And I think increasingly mainstream as people understand afterwards what it actually all meant, which is, you know, in hindsight, it always looks obvious. So I'd say that, like, that's one thing to look at. I think, as I said earlier, the ecosystems that are coming out of the platforms are probably the most interesting bridges because as the platforms get threatened, like the, the big internet monoliths, they can either double down on crushing their providers or they can make them healthier. And I think making them healthier is an emergent system where all these you know, third party ecosystems, or whatever it is, are going to look, are, are, are going to benefit very, very significantly. Um, so finding, finding ways to invest in those kind of areas, I think is very important. Unfortunately, everything I've looked at pretty much is like $5 million seed or an NFT or something a little bit dumb. Um, I think the way to look at it in a much more investable framework is what I've been thinking about for the last four months, which is network flows, which is that basically we've created these network flows and now everything that's a bottleneck is going to blow up. Um, supply chain, obviously. Right. But the, what does it mean? Maybe, to blow up? What does that mean? Well, look at the port of LA. That's what it means, right? Is that if you can if you can forecast where the bottleneck is, you're going to make or lose a fortune. Um, and then the second and third derivatives. So, like, best well, LME Metals Exchange is also having some challenges. Oh yeah, <laughs> copper. Yeah, copper. That that there's in the, in the storage. There, there's one not less than one year's use of China using copper. That's oh, all yeah. the storage there is of copper. So, so yeah, and everyone, the risk of not being able to deliver on spot copper. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my lord. So everyone's talking about the same thing in terms of industrial metals for, for batteries, right? Uh, yeah. Again, I'm not an expert, but it seems like a sensible Lithium, thing. Lithium, all that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry to disrupt your thoughts. No, 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 no. That's I, I've got no good ideas on this, so I need you guys. Um, but the the best call I've probably ever seen one of in at least 10, 15 years was Dan Wang at Gavcal, where he basically spent the whole pandemic reading squillion pages of turgid propaganda from the CCP and was like, they've realized consumer internet is not a good allocation of financial or, or, or personal capital. So it's like, they're 
and, and coupled with trade sanctions and the breakdown of the global supply chain, uh, they are basically going to embark upon a Manhattan project for their own domestic hard industry. And you're like, huh. And this was before any of the regulatory crackdown on anything. And you yeah, were yeah, like, well, it's like 2019. Yeah. Yeah. This guy did the work and he got the call. But mm -hmm. like the idea that China is now going to build itself out in semis and in, in hard industry and all of the all of the seriously geopolitical important stuff that Brits and Americans regard as kind of like, you know, too dirty work. Like, I think I think that's a theme that can run and run for a really long time. And obviously, the lateral is green that the amount of committed capital to that is just like crazy absurd. It's just I can't square the paradox of energy intensity and the amount of investment required to get us there. And most people seem to bridge that through industrial metals for batteries. Um, and I they've guess. been at this for like a decade, right? Because the Belt and Road Initiative, maybe not a decade, but the Belt and Road has been around for at least five years, I'm guessing. Yeah. And and their presence in Africa, particularly in the Congo, but in some other countries that are rich in rare earth metals, speaks a lot about how they're thinking. And I think this this speaks a lot about how the West has been like goes in in two year cycles, electoral cycles, particularly in the U.S., whereas they're thinking in decades. They, they, they're thinking about the the the, the century of, of 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 shame or, or or whatever the terminology is, and they're actually thinking about we're playing this long long game, but we're 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 going to get back on on everyone that's uh, wronged us. So so they're they've set the pieces on the table, and the West has it, it's taken a, a pandemic for for the West to wake up and to to, to realize. And I think that the term that you use there, uh, Manhattan Project, is is very precise. I mean, we we've uh, offline uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, described it in such terms because it really is a, a, a project of this magnitude that they're engaging. Uh, uh, the teenager is not allowed to play video games for more than two hours. Like they're re reorienting their, their human capital towards the most productive or at least what they perceive to be the most productive use of their times towards this, this greater project of, of Chinese hegemony. Mm. And it's will. They have the will. Whether or not it's directed yeah. in the right direction, they have the will and they demonstrated it. Now, how, how does the median voter concept manifest in that? Does it or exactly can it at some there. point? Oh, Mike, it's exactly there, which is that basically, so Papage had the same call as, as Dan Wang, just not as well, which is that basically it's a really interesting idea and I'm not sure it's true. And so don't quote me on it. But like the part of the reason the Chinese monitor the internet so much is not necessarily because they're looking for Winnie the Pooh picture, pictures of G. It's, <laughs> it's because they really, really have an incredibly nuanced understanding of what their population wants. They don't have voters, but right. you know, 50% of the Chinese population is now middle class. Everything that gets in the way of that middle class's prosperity is going to get crushed. And so they probably looked on social media and they were like, these property developers making out like bandits, done. These education systems that are a little bit fraudulent, done look how much time people are spending on tiktok done look at these oligarchs who are making out done and they probably crushed all these systems because they saw a groundswell and got ahead of it so they're not median voters but it is median preferences which are manifesting in the us in a completely different way which is we want more slack so i think that's a great question and i think that is that sort of is a theme that is potentially going to run and run so your thesis and admittedly you caveated it as being you know sort of the theory, but but if I read it right, it's these policies are reactionary, not strategic. Yeah. Well, who knows, right? Like, as Richard says, the Chinese are probably thinking about things a few stages ahead relative to people on shorter electrical cycles. But the idea is, is that you're either going to be smart and preemptive or you're going to get punished. And, and, and Clock Tower have done amazingly comprehensive work on this, looking at polls and looking at looking at, at, at shifts in governments towards their Buenos Aires consensus, where basically they've where, where like whatever comes out of a politician's mouth, they've now realized this is what's needed. And he thought it was happening before the pandemic, but the pandemic just provided air cover. And Russell Napier has been on this as well because he's turned into an inflationista where he's basically been like politicians now have the money tree. It's never happened. At least not in recent history, right? Politicians are not going to give up the money tree because why would you do that, right? And so you have this situation where, you know, everyone can get very worked up about fiscal stimulus and maybe it gets redirected in different ways. But whoever takes the money away, you know, good luck, right? Like maybe in America that'll work because people do still have this, you know, this 
this sort of bootstrap ideology. But I think in sort of the developed world, that's a trend that's not going away. So why aren't we seeing the same emergent preferences in Western democracies, right? I mean, just, just getting back to the idea that the CCP is monitoring the internet. They are, you know, finding the core themes that are working people up, that, ever, that people are getting angry about or, or have anxiety about or what have you. And they're, they're acting to, um, to move the system in, in towards a direction that, that is closer to the preferences of the middle class, right? So why do you think the middle class in Western democracies is having the same perceptions? And if, if, if so, what does that mean for policy in Western democracies going forward? Should we expect similar actions by governments against say, you know, big tech and, and incentivizing development in, in certain industries that are deemed both strategic and in service to the middle class? And I if would, not, then why, is, why are voters in Western democracies not having the same experience, the same anxieties and expressing the same preferences? I love the question, if this were true, what would happen, right? If this were true, what would be happening? And if the median voter theory was right, what would be happening? If you're in a two year, four year electoral cycle, right? So you can't be like Manhattan Project for green tech, although obviously in the US that's sort of happening. You right? tried. You're trying, right? And it might happen, right? And, and I don't want to denigrate the efforts of, of the American political system because that's like a cheap shot, right? Um, and the British one, right? It's just too easy. Um, so what do you do? You just give people a huge amount of money while you sort the rest of the problems out. And that's what's happened, right? You don't do that in China because that's not the way that you roll, right? But like with the tools that you have at your disposal, like the idea of just cutting Americans a check suddenly became possible during the pandemic. And now that's continued. Right. And so you're saying that you're asking me, like, why hasn't it happened? I'm saying it's happened. The only question is, is that how long is it here to stay for? And if this argument is right in one form or another, it's going to stay for a very long time. Now, the smartest way for it to happen would be for it to be sustained reshoring, right? Mm -hmm. Massive investment credits for people in middle America to rebuild, like Indianapolis, you know, the home state of KCP, right? Like one of the top reshoring destinations in the whole US, right? You could make the US a, a manufacturing hub again. And I think there's still very much the possibility that, that could happen on a long enough time frame. So it's possible, but at the moment, before it's possible, just give people money. And that seems to be what's happening. Yeah, I think I think Dave Dave Nadig makes a good point um, too that I think is where my mind went, Adam, when you said the preferences. Why aren't they the same? I mean, they're they're very distinctly different demographic pyramids with different um, you know age cohort makeups and wealth cohort makeups and religious backgrounds and uh, sort of uh, Western versus Eastern thinking. So I, I you know I could certainly see that there would be different preferences manifesting. And you would say that even if you went back into the U.S. and said, "Okay, what was what was manifesting in 1940 versus, you know, what was manifesting in Europe or or, yeah, or wherever?" So certainly the West, they're, they're viewing things through the the prism of individuality, and in, in, in the yeah in the East they're viewing them through the prism of collectivism, right? Uh, or at yeah. least that is a dimension through which there, there's a difference. Yeah. And there's there's yeah, and I'm and we couldn't begin to postulate all the dimensions that would be yeah, manifesting and all that, and and so I think that that's where. Uh, you know, my mind went on the, the variance. Um, it, it's, oh, what was my point now? Damn it. I hate when that happens. I do really. Anyway, back over to you guys. <laughs> there, is, there is an interesting tangent you raised, Mike, which um, I'm reading Parag Khanna's new book, Move, at the moment. It's really comprehensive piece of work, and he's good at global flows, right? So his current book is about what what's happening in demography and how is the world flowing? And it's a super interesting idea because it will have investment implications down the line. And it's basically that if you're rich, educated, and mostly Asian, pretty much, but basically rich and educated, you'll go anywhere you like. You'll go to the city. You'll go where the action is. This whole work from home thing probably doesn't last for very long, particularly not 
in the east right so basically you're going to have this continued massive kind of assortive mating where everyone just goes um, you know within china has more internal migrants than the rest of the world has migrants i love that stat right like wow. it's just this this crazy amount of mobility that's happening stopped only by nation states right the nation states put up these semi-artificial barriers and stop people from, from coming in and at the moment you're having more people i think in 10 years you're gonna have more people hitting adult working age in sub-Saharan Africa than the rest of the world combined. Um, and you have no infrastructure for them to grow into because we solved child mortality without any sort of solution for that, right? And so you're basically going to have this mass migration coming at the very high end, but also on the lowest end at exactly the same time as rural America and rural developed societies pretty much across the board are going to get hollowed out like really badly hollowed out if they haven't already been becoming sort of opioid paradises and industrial husks, right? And the moment that happens, I'm generalizing, they tend to become more hostile to immigration because it comes a squid game, right? It becomes a zero sum game and people don't like other people coming in and taking the pie. So you're going to have this fascinating paradox for the next 10 years where basically all these areas that need migrants most, in many cases, become incredibly hostile to them. And it's countries that are going to be able to work out how to assimilate migrants and how to bring in talent at the high and the low end. They're going to do really, really well. But in the interim, you're probably going to have a rightward shift, particularly in places in Europe where they just don't want to bring anyone else in as things dwindle. Like Bulgaria has the fastest shrinking population in the world. Interesting. Amazing. Yeah. I want to come back to um, to supply chains because they actually that was asked by few people on Twitter, right? How do you, how, how do we see the um, evolution of these bottlenecks? What happens when they get unlocked? That sort of thing, right? And um, what occurred to me as I was sort of thinking through that is this is sort of the, the, the essential crux of queuing theory, um, which Chris Schindler brought up during our conversation a few months ago in the context of kind of trend following an emergence in price, right? But like what we've seen over the last several months, right? As we've tried to sort of reopen in this lurching kind of staggered way is that you've got these supply chain bottlenecks. You don't quite know where there's gonna be bottlenecks at what, at what time. You don't know what the supply dynamics are. You don't quite know what interruptions to the demand dynamics are, et cetera. Um, but there are, there are these bottlenecks and, and the bottlenecks cause not just a small shift in price, but a massive explosion in price. Like we've seen this in so many different, especially sort of commodities over the last six to nine months, right? whether it's coal or natural gas in Europe or petroleum products in Europe or Lumber. petroleum products everywhere, obviously copper currently in, in Europe, um, a bunch of like magnesium, a bunch of less well-known metals, et cetera. Um, and the lesson is that, well, a lesson is that it doesn't take very much supply demand imbalance to, to change the price dynamics by orders of magnitude, right? The relationships are so profoundly yeah. nonlinear, non -linear, right? And this to me is, is almost a perfect argument for why you need a sleeve of something like trend following in the portfolio, right? And especially trend following on commodities because commodities are the most vulnerable to these types of, um, of queuing effects, right? These dislocations that cause these massive, um, um, you know, phase transitions in price, right? Um, so, so, and just at a, at a slightly higher level, any type of period where the level of uncertainty is very high, there's a lot of pressure built up in the system. Maybe it's because of interconnectedness that has led to fragility. There's a lack of slack at the moment. And, and because there's a lack of slack and there's fragility and there's so many nodes in the network, you get a lot of opportunity for dislocations and you know phase transitions in prices. You need diversity of exposures and you need 
the ability to to take advantage of these types of explosive price dynamics in the different areas where they might occur, right? And and so a way that that investors may either hedge risks of these types of episodes or maybe profit or take advantage of these types of episodes is to allocate a little bit more to trend following type strategies. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to leave that to you as someone who's probably forgotten more than I'll ever understand about it. Um, the one thing I'll say that I find super interesting, uh, a lot of stuff comes in from my network because I'm super, super fortunate in that way. And and someone who's come in a couple of times, literally in the last few weeks, is uh, David Dredge. I don't know if you guys know him. Um, runs a company called, I think, Convex Strategies out of Singapore. Um, and he's written two papers recently. Oh, he writes the Dredge Report, right? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, no, I think that's, approach. isn't that him? It might be. Well, I, 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 I thought, I thought of the Dredge point. Report too, but anyway. I'd, I'd point listeners to his last two monthlies uh, that I probably understood less than 50% of because um, there's a lot of fractal stuff in there. But what I did understand of it, it he, he, he went on a podcast on Macro Hive that got me to read Pearback's book, How Nature Works, that I probably understood 30% of. But it's all about fractal scaling, right? And... The idea being that basically we've hit a very fragile part of the sand pile. So we can expect shit to get weird on a, on a very regular basis. And yeah. the reason why I love the supply chain situation so much is because it's, it could be not, it could not be more perfect for what we, for everything that we've just been talking about. It's just this, this is this illustration in front of us of butterfly yeah. effects of cascades of everything. Right. So like implementation is always like crazy, but I think about, distribution of risk within a portfolio is going to have to be very, very different to the way it used to be in the past, because there's no such thing as a standard deviation anymore. But also like, you know, I love the idea that if you're an unconstrained family office, the best thing to do is wait for like a French bank or someone that has no idea what they're doing, not the French banks don't know what they're doing, but you know, just for example, um, to sell you something with like an inappropriate notional and, and like really massive payoffs where someone on the selling end, doesn't understand what the or just doesn't care what the incentives are in terms of their misalignment and yeah. like i like that idea in terms of like finding something that operates on a different time scale to the one that you're working on where the you know it, it like an ackman-esque 21 million for a 2.7 billion payoff or whatever it is like assuming you've got someone on your team that's smart enough to be able to price and work out when you are actually being sold something mispriced which is the world's biggest assumption that seems to me like an interesting way to look at the world i'm just sure that there are people with millions of magnitude more intelligence than me looking at that but you know like one one river was saying ctas as well as the way to play the current trends so you yeah, well, I mean, there's there's this macro sort of asymmetric payoffs where you're trying to identify where there may be explosive dynamics in the future and position for ex for those explosive dynamics, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that's sort of trying to decipher complex systems, right? It's sort of, it's it's trying to attach a narrative and and and, and examine, you know, play out the 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 branching the, the tree of possibilities and then examine where some of the bottlenecks might occur and then where there might be some explosive reactions there. What, and I think there's a role for that, right? And what's, there's also a role, and I think this is more consistent with a lot of what you write about, which is the idea that complex dynamic systems can't be controlled and they can't be effectively forecasted, at least not on timeframes that, um, that most investors operate on, right? Which is sort of six months to a year, or two, two years, et cetera, right? Or 10 years. And, What's so, what's so interesting about trend following is like a, as a complement to those types of active or macro kind of convex positioning strategies is that the price will tell you when there's a dislocation and you just wait for it's You're just waiting and adapting to what the system is telling you is happening right now rather than trying to anticipate what the system will do, right? What the emergent dynamics will be. Um, totally, totally, yeah. I think I think that to sorry, are you still going? Go no, no. I, I think I think the one thing you can do though is work out where the doors are and how big they are, right? You can never know where the system's gonna go. But like I, I, I listened to two good podcasts recently, one by Dennis Lynch at Counterpoint, 
And he's like, all of, well, not all. He's like, a great deal of our money has been made by, by gigs misclassifications, right? That basically stuff that it was a tech company was categorized as stable and was being covered by the wrong analysts. And I saw that a, a bunch in my career as well, where basically just like to the left hemisphere, right hemisphere dichotomy, Richard, something was flowing in the wrong category. And something that um, I'm sure you guys know, Dan McMurtry at Tyro, something he's talked about a lot that I think is very smart is the idea of constraint arbitrage. That basically you find a company that is un, uh, uninvestable and unownable by a really big cohort of investors, mm -hmm. because one of the few remaining constraints in the market is, is style buckets, right? And these guys have these really strict mandates in a world that's flowing faster than it's ever flown before. And so they just they won't take the career risk because of the market cap or because of the mm -hmm. categorization or because of the management team or any of those things. And if you can work out where there's a really big constraint that's about to be removed, that's probably better than fundamental analysis in a lot of situations because you're ESG and energy. Close, yeah. It, yeah. it is a prime example of recent uh, quarters. Perfect. Flows corrupt absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I still Mike, you, you, you made, Absolute I remember you, your story of making a lot of money when um, CalPERS and, and a lot of the major pension plans were forced to divest of, of tobacco stocks, right? Right. And then it, anyways, you, you go ahead and tell it, but that, that always, I remember. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a classic scenario where the last seller sold. In, in a dynamic where, you know, tobacco stocks were out of favor in the late nineties with all of the lawsuits and whatnot. And there was a movement, uh, probably not dissimilar to the movement against um, petroleum and, and fossil fuels over the last couple of years, leads to a point where the last seller who's going to sell, sells. And thus there's only buying. And this is the buying and selling dynamics. Sometimes it's the movie theater on file, everyone's getting out. But, and sometimes it's everybody's getting in. And, and that the demand is is so big that you've got the right tail and left tail dynamics that are disequilibrium opportunities. Um, but, you, you know, you had a 9% yield on Philip Morris or something like that, and nobody wanted it. I kind of was like, well, this is a definitely a winning trade okay. because nobody wants it. And, you know, it, take, it took time, but that that is that probably was a little bit ahead of price. So in, in the other example, Adam, you're, you're yep. suggesting like you just, you look at this. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think a door is um, as we move from fossil fuels to electrons, how do we produce electrons? And the electrons become the primary, if the link to electrons and cryptocurrency and the blockchain is something that grows. So now we have, um, electrons being sort of the currency. It's not a petrodollar, it's an electron dollar. And in that context, you layer on top of the ESG, it's hard not to make a case for nuclear becoming a major source of uh, electrons because it meets a whole bunch of these uh, dynamics. And at the same time, we had the Fukus Fukushima-ization of um, you know, sort of the, the demonization of that type of energy creation leading to a set of dynamics that to me look very fragile at the moment, almost tobacco-esque 1999, if you will. Um, so there's like, there's a whole bunch of layers there of a tapestry or gestalt of different ideas that come together in my mind that are very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if we're going you know, to speculate on where doors could be that are are interesting, I think that's something that is uh, you know something I, I think is is got some potential at the at this moment but you're right you, you know i don't know maybe maybe that'll happen maybe it won't but the the tinder's dry that's the don cox analogy right of of the best opportunities uh lie where those who know it best love at least because they've been disappointed most right <laughs> and um you know that your uranium and nuclear right i mean the, 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 we're we're no longer at the sort of trough where everybody has abandoned nuclear, but we're mm. just at the beginning of the revitalization of of the nuclear sector. There's been no investment in uranium mining for for you know basically the ten years since Fukushima. Everyone had sort of abandoned it, and this may be an opportunity. We may see some sort of queuing theory type bottlenecks in. Oh that yeah, and, sector and in the, over the, the production of the the, the yellow cake has been. Um, um, also uh, disrupted by the the uh, virus, and there was uh, a number of shutdowns at the mine due to some of the um, COVID issues during the pandemic. 
So they had full shutdowns of production at time as well, or not partial shutdowns anyway, in, in certain areas of mining. So there's all kinds of fun stuff that that's occurring in that area that we're anyway, for what it's yep. worth. Yep. No, absolutely. Um, anyway, we are sneaking up on oh, two hours yeah. here, Tom. Um, you have been extraordinarily generous with your time. Thank you so much. You've, you've continued to maintain fantastic energy throughout. So uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, where can everyone find you? Uh, thekcpgroup.com, um, where you can sign up for my uh, twice monthly uh, writings and ramblings. I'm going to do an absolutely insane one next Saturday, and then I'm going to go back to normal where I'm going to talk about flows. Um, hit me up if you've got any good ideas on these flows and bottlenecks. It's something I'm going to be spending the next couple of years on. Uh, so if you're listening to this, ping it over. Um, I'm also always looking for good stuff. Um, and I've built, an, as I said, an incredible network of contributors and friends, always open for a Zoom call like this with people to just chat things over. Um, and I'm always looking for interesting speakers. I do a speaker series every whenever. Um, we've got Leah DiBello, uh, who's um, got an incredible thesis on accelerated learning and business expertise that's going to be on November the 11th. And then, fingers crossed, I've got Ian McGilchrist, the guy that wrote The Master and Emissary. Come on. Yeah, best book I've ever read. He's coming on uh, early December. But between now and then, he's releasing a 1,400-page book, which I can't obviously not read. So I'm uh, probably going to have my child a metaphorical orphan until that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so I they, they can find you where, where at, at Tom, where at, um, give us at the Tom handles. underscore Morgan KCP on Twitter and uh, the KCP group dot com on uh, to sign up for the distribution. And if they sign up on the email distribution, they get the newsletter and alerted when you're having the speaking engagements and things like Correct. that. Correct. Perfect. Get yeah. This was awesome, Tom. Exceeded expectations. Yeah. And yeah. uh Really appreciate your time today. Thanks yeah, the comments us. was on Fuego. Thank you oh, very much for great. taking the time with us and we look forward to having you back. Thanks, Thanks so much to everyone who participated and asked questions and made great insightful comments. Um, and thanks in advance for clicking the like button and for sharing this content if you feel it's worthwhile. Oh yeah, share it on Fuego. <laughs> Have a good Fuego. evening all. Thanks, Thanks guys. You. Thanks everyone. Thank you. See ya. This episode is brought to you by Resolve Asset Management, Inc.'s separately managed accounts, available for U.S. and Canadian investors. While diversification is often discussed, it is important that it actually be delivered. Through the suite of Resolve Global mandates offered at varying risk levels, we aim to strike the balance between global diversification, appropriate risk balance, and directional alpha. Our portfolios are designed to safeguard and profit across many economic regimes, including periods of negative growth shocks or unexpected rising inflation, periods in which, in our view, the traditional 60-40 portfolios may fail to deliver adequate returns for investors. Resolve to improve your portfolio. Click on the link in the description to reach out to a representative and assess which Resolve mandate is right for you.